So hello folks, and um, I'm glad to be here with you today. And I'm gonna uh, present some information that has to do with a, uh, a pretty complicated story that's involved with the Cherokee removal. What I'm leading off with here is uh, you know, a couple of the national seals. And of course, you're all familiar with the seal of the Cherokee Nation, and then also the United Kadua Band. And, and these are both uh, governments that were ultimately born out of the uh, um, events that took place in 1838 um, and 1839, um, in some cases with the UKB earlier, but they all have to do with the immigration, with the, the removal or, or uh, um, just the, the physical immigration of Cherokee people to west of the Mississippi. There is one third Cherokee uh, tribe that's federally recognized, and that's the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And they have a really different arc to their history. And that's what I'd like to explore today because they are born from their remaining in place in the old Cherokee Nation. And so I'd like to look at a couple of stories uh, that have to do with that uh, resistance against removal and then the recovery and resilience of those communities in the period after removal. My title today is Whatever Risk They Might Run, the Cherokee Responses to Removal in North Carolina. And I take that title from a quote from a guy named George Fanshawe, who was in the Cherokee Nation traveling around in 1837. And he's down in the Valley River Valley to the southwest of present day Cherokee, North Carolina. And he says he encounters a Cherokee on horseback, John Welch. Now remember this name because we'll be talking about John Welch quite a bit. And John Welch told him then that the Cherokees were determined not to abandon their country, whatever risk they might run. I'm actually going to start this story with this view of Kadua and end this story at Kadua as well. Kadua is, of course, the, the great mother town, the origin place of the Anegadua, the Cherokee people the place where uh, the Creator's fire was first set down and the great fire of the Cherokee people resided for, for centuries. You probably all, you probably all know this map uh, from Charles Royce, this, this map of Cherokee territorial claims. And back in, in 1700, if we look at this map, Kadu is centered in the Cherokee territory. But then there's a progressive loss of territory through various treaty agreements with first the United States, first the Great Britain, and then the United States. And so we see this pattern of loss beginning at about 1721 and progressively speeding up through the 1770s into the Revolutionary War era. 1785, after the end of the American Revolution, right on up as the Cherokee Nation's territory is whittled down through these claims, right on up to 1816, where we'll look at something that the folks at Kadua uh, transmitted. And that's this letter to Return Mix, who's the federal agent to the Cherokees. And they are really taking him to task in this. This is the council at Kadua, and they're writing Return Megs that he is not paying any attention to the people of Kadua or the people of the upper towns that he only listens to the lower towns, the people who are selling off land. And so they say to him, we must conclude that we're left to do the best we can for ourselves and must act accordingly because he does not take them to be any part of the nation. And this is not an empty threat that these people put forth. You see, right after that, there's land loss in 1817. And then in 1819, the old town place, the sacred town of Kadua, is swept up in the sessions that resulted in the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation shrinking down to where they stabilized until 1838. You can see then that Kadua was uh, several miles outside the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation, but it's still important to Cherokee people. And one way that they were able to to, to try to hold on to this place uh, was 
based in that, those treaties of 1817 and 1819, those treaties set up a system of reserves to individuals. So in Article 8, it says to each and every um, head of any Indian family residing on the east side of the Mississippi River on the lands that are now or hereafter surrendered to the United States, and then critically, who may wish to become citizens of the United States, they agree to give a reservation of 640 acres of land as a life estate to these people. They are to register their name, register their names with the Cherokee agent with MIGS. But if they move away from these reserves, then they lose claim to them. That's reiterated in the Treaty of 1819. And it also says who choose to become citizens of the United States in the manner stipulated in said treaty. Now, MIGS and the federal government didn't expect much uh, response to this. They thought that was more of a kind of a bribe for Cherokee leaders to try to get them to enter into these sessions. But in fact, more than 100 Cherokee families registered their names uh, with MIGS for a reserve. You see here, here's the uh, uh, filing of our friend John Welch from the, from the very beginning there, where he's registering for a uh, reserve. And then this is the bearer will noting who is part of the uh, council there at Kadua. Here's the survey of Will Nody's reserve. And so when you look at this list of reservees in North Carolina, there were over 75 reservations in North Carolina. Many of them are people who were seated at Kadua in council and signed that memorial. So they are right then stepping outside of the Cherokee Nation. They have, um, uh, they are now doing for themselves the best they can. As MIGS, as they accused MIGS of taking them to be no part of the nation, now they are trying to set up their own um, separate organizations. You also see John Welch and another fellow, Gideon Morris, here, who we'll look at a little later. So the reserves, there were 49 of these reserves that were actually platted out in North Carolina of those 75. And you'll see a pattern, and this is a pattern recurrent throughout this, this reservation system, is they're tightly clustered. And that's because these reservees, contrary to what the federal government intended, which was people to become landowners in severalty and, and be uh, you know, separate sort of American style agrarian farmers, what these folks were doing were claiming big blocks of land to preserve their communities, to hold their communities together they held these lands, they considered them to be lands held in common, and there were in fact hundreds and hundreds of people who lived on these reserves, like those around Kadua. And most of the people there around Kadua are people who had signed that uh, memorial to Migs. For those at Cowie or Burningtown or Watauga or Little Teleco, and there are a number of these community clusters, these people were organized in a, a uh, sort of a corporate fashion. They designated certain people to take certain reserves at places so they could create these contiguous blocks of reserves in this land base for their communities that they saw um, continuing to exist outside the bounds of the Cherokee Nation. Unfortunately, the state of North Carolina did not see it that way, nor did any of the other states within which these reserves were taken. So North Carolina, for instance, passed a law so that each and every purchaser of any section, that is, North Carolina sold off all these lands contrary to the federal titles that Cherokee reservees held, and that each purchaser of a section would have the power to institute an ejection, an ejection action in the name of North Carolina against anyone who is in possession of that land. They followed up on that very quickly. You remember Gideon Morris, well, he had a reserve at Franklin, North Carolina, and in a suit that he later brought, he said the state had caused a survey of his lands and that those were then bought uh, as a state title by a guy named Robert Love, who commenced a whole series of attacks against the family in order to chase them off the land. And ultimately, when Gideon Morris was away from home, burned down the house and set his family out in cold and snowy weather. And so that's the way they were pushed off their reserve. 
almost every single one of these families was pushed away from their reserve. And now they were outside the Cherokee Nation, but they had no land. Some of these people uh, then moved into the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation and resumed their lives as citizens of the Cherokee Nation. But a lot of these folks continued to live outside the boundaries of the nation um, on lands that had not been sold off by the state, or in some cases, lands that they were able to reside on um, through agreements with some of the white settlers who had moved in. So we're gonna move away from these folks right now and look at what happens after this. Um, there had been, um, I'll back up for a second here. Um, these Cherokee reservees, though, had not taken these actions land down. Um, they had contested um, in court the actions of, of these purchasers and ultimately the actions of the state. Uh, took it all the way to the North Carolina Supreme Court in 1824 and got a ruling, in fact, that the state of North Carolina was in error. Um, and not only were they entitled to continue to hold these lands, but they were also entitled to be citizens of the state of North Carolina. And that was confirmed by a court ruling by the highest court in North Carolina. Most of the reserves were then lost and the state of North Carolina had to scramble to try to reach some kind of agreements with uh, the reservees and ultimately seated a commission uh, that made some settlements in 1828 and 1829. Immediately after that, immediately after that, of course, 1828 was the year of Andrew Jackson's election. And then 1830 was when the Indian Removal Act passed through the actions and efforts of Andrew Jackson and his Secretary of War, Lewis Cass, to then try to dispossess all of the native peoples east of the Mississippi. And this was ultimately a, a death knell for corporate native claims in the east. Five years after the passage of that act, we see the Treaty of New Echota coming to pass. And this is, um, that five years was a, a period of tremendous pressure on Cherokee people and, Cherokee, and the Cherokee Nation, and ultimately a small group of Cherokee leaders who were not empowered to do so, met with U.S. commissioners and signed a, uh, an agreement that consigned Cherokee people to immigration to the West and total cession of all lands held east of the Mississippi in, in what we now know as the pretty infamous Treaty of New Echota. That affected not only the people within the Cherokee Nation, but as far as the federal government was concerned, applied to all Cherokees residing uh, east of the Mississippi. Of course, the national government led by John Ross and George Lowry um, contested not only the treaty, but then fought uh, vigorously against the ratification of the treaty by Congress. Um, th there's this well-known memorial of the Cherokees where they have over 15,000 signatures of Cherokee citizens who uh, reject the treaty as not representing their voice and as being a, uh, a, a false instrument, it, it being a false treaty. But then, of course, we know that the, uh, the Senate ratified the treaty by a very narrow margin, and it was signed um, into law by Andrew Jackson, who modified the terms of the treaty before he signed it, setting into motion what we now know as the Trail of Tears immigration of the Cherokee people. While uh, Congress was debating the treaty, um, there was a, a, a representative of those Eastern Cherokees who lived outside of the Cherokee Nation, this guy, William Holland Thomas, who went up to Washington, D.C. He was introduced to the Secretary of War by James Graham, who was then a Senator. And Holland had been, had actually grown up um, among the Eastern Cherokees and among these people, these former reservees, he'd moved into the area when it was still reserved land and learned to speak Cherokee. He was um, uh, orphaned, at least by his father, and purportedly adopted by 
the leader, Yon Aguska, who was one of the uh, counselors there at, at um, uh, Kadua. And Thomas then becomes an agent, a legal agent, because he had studied law. Uh, ultimately, he becomes a legal agent for the Eastern Cherokees and a legal representative because the voice of these uh, Cherokee reservees, the people outside the nation, had not entered into that treaty or those treaty negotiations. And he was described by, by one observer as a very busy little man. Uh, that was Evan Jones who saw him around the Cherokee agency. Will Thomas was known uh, to Cherokee people as uh, Willie Usti, Little Willie. Uh, so we'll just keep this guy in mind as Little Willie. But he figures prominently throughout the remainder of this story. Thomas goes to Washington and he is trying to get these, these uh, Cherokee families that live outside the nation included in the benefits that might have true to Cherokee people under that Treaty of New Echota, that is annuities, uh, shares of, of the sale, et cetera. But he also tries to get them excluded from the requirement for immigration, particularly representing towns of Kuala and then Alarca, Aquonis, Tekoa, and Ch um, Chioa, representing their voices. He's empowered by, by Cherokee individuals to do that. Now, Kuala was outside the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation, but those other communities were inside the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. Ultimately, he gets an agreement um, from the committee, the Cherokee Committee, which was um, at that time um, a group of the Treaty Party individuals that had been appointed by commissioners to review um, any, any claims and, and questions about the treaty. He has approval from them to exempt this group of people living uh, along Soco Creek in, in the area of Kuala um, and specifically enumerates those people. Um, so they are listed by name and the numbers of their families as being uh, exempt or immune from um, the requirement for removal. So that was signed um, April 6th of 1837. And Thomas achieved at least part of his mission there to Washington, D.C. for these folks, who he considered his, his friends and close neighbors. Also in 1837, we see the federal government is now uh, preparing for what they see as an inevitable uh, forced deportation of Cherokee people. And they begin establishing uh, uh, military presence in the Cherokee Nation. They send Brigadier General John Ellis Wool um, down to uh, Charleston, Tennessee, to Fort Cass, establish Fort Cass there. And then he begins establishing a whole series of military posts uh, throughout the Cherokee Nation, uh, an effort that was then continued by his successor, uh, Colonel William Lindsay until they get an entire network of uh, military garrisons across the Cherokee Nation. So the folks um, throughout the Cherokee Nation can see fully the intent of the US government to force the removal of Cherokee people. Here's just a view of where the forts are in North Carolina and their relation to our beginning point of Kadua. And uh, a lot of our story now centers across this landscape here in southwestern North Carolina. And here's where we get back uh, in our timeline with George Fanshaw, where he has encountered John Welch. And Welch at this time, even though the, uh, the sort of drumbeat of removal has sped up considerably when the uh, army has, has begun to establish in the region, uh, Welch tells Fanshawe that the Cherokees are de determined not to abandon their country, whatever risk they might run. And this is running directly counter to all of the trends in motion. What Fanshawe doesn't reveal to anybody, those are from his memoirs, and, and he doesn't have anything in his memoirs that, that represents that he's actually a spy for the federal government. Um, he's sending memoranda to General Winfield Scott, who's the highest ranking officer in the US Army, describing different individuals and their prospects for either 
cooperating with or trying to foil the Cherokee removal. He sees uh, Archibald Hunter at the mouth of Valley River. He runs into a guy named, he describes him as Squire Starrett or Squire Starrett. This is Preston Starrett. And he evaluates their character. What he never figures out is that as he's riding down Valley River with John Welch, he's talking to the very person who is going to push the resistance to the Cherokee removal. We also see that in 1837, uh, Willie Oostie, little Willie, that, that very busy little man, has been working through that area in the rest of North Carolina, trying to to figure out ways that people can stay, people that he knows primarily, can stay in North Carolina, even if they are not registered in that list uh, that had been filed with the War Department. So for instance, in a deposition that Wachacha or the grasshopper gave in November of 1837, he says that Mr. Thomas told him that like the, that the head men of North Carolina were advising him uh, to go to New Echota and other people get their papers to become citizens and that they could continue to live in the country. And they wouldn't be molested just as the Indians who lived outside the nation were. So this idea of getting citizenship then becomes the ticket for people who are gonna to try to remain in the old homelands. As for John Welch, we see his voice later on consistent with what he has already said to Fanshawe. So in a, in a meeting that, that Colonel Joseph Powell holds at Fort Delaney, where he's telling people that they need to get ready for immigration and go ahead and start, because even though he's been there protecting them in their rights and claims, that as soon as the um, expiration of that deadline um, took place, that he would then have to go around and begin arresting people and that it would be attended with the inevitable destruction of the Cherokees if they forced this. And then he held back John Welch and Old Hawk to say, what are you guys going to do? Because these are two of the leaders in the Valley River area. And Welch, uh, who seems to have been a man of few words, said that, well, if Ross can't, can't come back, that he'll go to Washington, D.C. himself and whip Ross and do the business of uh, renegotiating the treaty. Of course, in May 1838, Winfield Scott takes his position at Fort Cass, sends out orders for the beginning of the forced removal of the deport arrest and the arrest and deportation of Cherokee people. And this puts into motion the military activities that uh, Colonel Powell had warned against. So it begins in May, at the end of May in, in uh, Georgia, and in, then is delayed into June in um, uh, North Carolina and Tennessee. In Georgia, they had gone house to house, farm to farm, gathering up families without warning, herding people away. And it was a fairly chaotic scene. Um, and Scott wanted to try to stage the arrest of Cherokee people and not clog up the immigration depots. And he also wanted to stem the abuses that were being documented in Georgia. And so he delayed um, the military actions in North Carolina and Tennessee and Alabama until they were able to sort of clear the decks. And here I'm going to pick up another story. I'm going to bring another character in. And it's this guy, uh, this kind of fierce looking guy, George Washington Hayes. He's, uh, he, you know, he's, he's all hat and no cattle, though. Um, Hayes was actually involved in the military uh, roundup and removal of Cherokee people in North Carolina. Um, but it's not what it seems. In fact, he had been a neighbor and friend of William Holland Thomas had grown up adjacent to the Cherokees on the Oconaluftee River and was a fluent speaker of the Cherokee language. He was a sergeant and became an interpreter and in many cases intervened in, in various activities in that um, uh, removal operation. 
And he left us a detailed account of those arrests. And I won't read all these out, but he says that he's an interpreter. They're going around from house to house, uh, actually waking families up because they start before day. So they can sort of surprise people. And then he comes to a house of an aged patriarch that he had known since childhood. In fact, this was an individual called the Standing Wall that he had learned the Cherokee language from. And this was Wayakatoga. And he tells about his family and how ultimately he allows that family to remain in their homes until it's time that they have to march away. So he, he's able to give them that uh, concession as requested by the standing wall. What he doesn't tell in this account is he knows these people intimately and they all have a plan that they've worked out together. Ultimately, Standing Wolf and his family are taken to Fort Lindsay on the Nantahala River, that northernmost uh, uh, removal fort. At the same time, when people like um, Standing Wolf and his neighbors are coming in voluntarily to these posts after being notified, there are other people who are, are, are giving the Army a run for their money. For instance, um, Lieutenant Colonel John Gray Bynum reported in on June 13th, and they had begun this, this, their operations on June 12th. He said, I collected yesterday about 80 Indians. They had all received orders from Welch, remember our friend John Welch, on Valley River to leave home and take to the mountains. And then a few days later, we see um, that Captain Porter relates back to his commander, Abraham Eustace, that he's, he's stationed people near John Welch's house and at Nancy Colbert's house, because it's there that the people who had fled to the mountains are being fed and harbored and getting information. And he says, they should be, Welch's family, Nancy Col Colbert should be apprehended and sent in. But he understands that Welch's people have liberty from General Eustace. In fact, Welch had um, a permit to remain in the country that was issued by the superintendent of removal. Then back to Standing Wolf. Standing Wolf leaves Fort Lindsay with a, a party of prisoners on June 20th. And George Hayes says, we parted ways and I never thought that I would see him again as they marched off. Their journey from Fort Lindsay to Fort Cass took a couple of weeks. It was a very convoluted route. Along these roads in North Carolina, they followed the Tennessee River Turnpike, and then they got to the Great State Road, which you can see vestiges of it here. Progressing about eight miles a day on foot until they came to the house of John Welch on the Valley River. And there, they were detained for days because Preston Sturette, if you remember Sturette from Fanshawe's report, now he's an agent for immigration. He is an employee of the federal government to enroll people for immigration. But when they get to Welch's house, Preston Sturette is now granting permissions to people to stay behind in North Carolina. That is exempting them from the military arrests and deportation. And Abraham Eustace writes to Winfield Scott, he says that they've been detained here for days, that Preston Sturett has granted permissions to hundreds of Indians to remain in the country. Here's one of these permission slips there at the bottom. Now that had come out of an earlier agreement where Preston Sturett had requested his friend, who was the superintendent of immigration, Nathaniel Smith, to write to the War Department and ask for um, the leeway to permit, as he said, 200 old and infirm Cherokees to remain and become citizens. This was granted, this request was granted by the Secretary of War. And then, of course, they couldn't leave behind the families of these individuals, to just abandon them. There had to be someone to take care of them. Here's a permit that was actually written out to, to uh, Big George or Romanos, who's the leader of Chioa. 
who ultimately immigrated to the West. But these permits, as they came in, were then rescinded by Abraham Eustace, and they fired Preston Sturette um, and rebuked uh, the, the superintendent of immigration for this pattern. So this whole idea of trying to give these permits out to people, which was one of the contingencies that folks had counted on, is now falling apart. They all end up in Fort Butler, this group from Fort Lindsay. So Standing Wolf's there at Fort Butler. And with a group of about 400 people then begin their march almost immediately because Eustace is so impatient. He wants to go back home. This is the last group. He's trying to get them on the road. So he doesn't even give them a day to rest. And they begin this march uh, down to Fort Cass. They travel along the Unicoi Turnpike from Fort Butler and ultimately end up at Fort Cass on the 12th of July. When they enter Fort Cass, they're taken in by Captain Page who, who musters the group and records their names. And then they find their places in the immigration camps that are already established around Fort Cass. They had arrived a day after the completion of this map, which marks out the immigration camps. And Standing Wolf and his family go down to the Rattlesnake Springs, which is just outside Cleveland, Tennessee, near Camp Worth and Fort Foster. They establish at Rattlesnake Springs. Most of the people from his district were to the north on South Mouse Creek. But they, uh, they, they come here and they're you know, in these encampments down uh, Rattlesnake Branch from the springs. Now we're going to shift back, sorry to jump back and forth, but we're going to try to keep this in chronological order. John Welch and his family have up to this point stayed out of the hands of the army because he is permitted by Smith to, um, to stay behind. Uh, they have been able to continue in the Valley River Valley and he travels down to Fort Cass when the commissioners are meeting there to collect the monies for their farmlands, et cetera, that they're entitled under uh, the terms of the treaty to have. So he travels along with his neighbors who also have exemptions, including uh, Gideon Morris, Junaluska, and Wachacha, his son, Edward Welch, his wife, Elizabeth Welch, and his son-in-law, Johnny Powell. When they get down there, then Welch, John Welch, his son, Edward, Junaluska, and Wachacha are suddenly taken prisoner. They're grabbed by the US Army. They can't hold Elizabeth Welch or Gideon Morris or John Powell because they are all um, uh, US citizens. They're all whites. And then they take off to go back home. We have this deposition from Stephen Hempstead, and he talks about these people being held in the military guardhouse. They're often uh, marched to see Winfield Scott. And then he notes that one was taken by Ath to Athens by writ of habeas corpus, but returned. That was Wachacha, and Wachacha was the only Cherokee who challenged, openly challenged the federal government over his arrest and took the federal government to court over that under writ of habeas corpus, where he presented his case that he was entitled to the rights and privileges of an American citizen under the treaties of 1817 and 1819, that he was citizenized, as he said, and that those rights and privileges had never been forfeited, and that he was being wrongfully transported, threatened with transport under duress uh, to Arkansas against violation of his rights as an American citizen. This sent Winfield Scott, the commander, into panic because they also contested the right of the federal government to forcibly hold and deport any uh, Cherokee under the terms of the treaties. Winfield Scott went to court as the uh, attorney for the federal government and ultimately defeated uh, Wachacha's lawyers in court. But we can see that this is this is the, 
the route by which people are going to try to stay in is Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, I believe we've lost Brett at the moment. We'll try to get him back as soon as we can. We're having some technical difficulties. Please. So, can you hear me now? There we go. Here we go. Okay. And can you see my screen share? Yes, sir. Oh, no, sir. I see you. But no screen share. Okay. And are we now in screen share? Yes. Okay, very good. So while Chacha and his family slip away at night, but he's not the only one. There are actually multiple families that leave right at the same time in August. The reason they're leaving is in fact, because of the arrest of John Welch, Wachacha, and Jenaluska, because they are all part of a larger plan that's orchestrated by Welch, Wachacha, Thomas, et cetera, to be able to escape and return to North Carolina and then enter as citizens and have lands, uh, sort of a restoration of their lands. Once they have collected their claims, they had all collected their claims from the Board of Commissioners and then they leave. But now that uh, Wachacha and Jenaluska and Welch are all being held, they're seeing this plan fall to pieces. And so they escape then in the middle of the night. Uh, some, they go to different sectors, including the Walchese family that goes to take shelter with Emanuel Schuler. They had known Emanuel Schuler for quite a while and not coincidentally, Emanuel Schuler was the first cousin of G.W. Hayes and was also a fluent Cherokee speaker. And Winfield Scott, contrary to what Hayes writes about, Winfield Scott says that everybody was impatient about the delay of immigration. And he attributed uh, that impatience where he says that in, impatience then leads to the escape of eight or 10 families of North Carolina Indians. They'd settled their claims with the Board of Commissioners and trusted their money with designing white men. And he's talking about George Hayes at this point to purchase land at the sales that were then going on and um, to allow those people to go back to their own farms. Winfield Scott doubts the sincerity of this, and it's with this that he sends a whole other expedition of troops to recapture these people 
who've escaped back to North Carolina. George Hayes has gone on home and within a couple of weeks, lo and behold, here's the Standing Wolf and his family that come in to, to Hayes' house while this expedition is now running around in the woods in North Carolina. He meets them, he feeds everybody, and then he tells them to go off to uh, the community of folks who are at, um, at Kuala, where those are people that the government couldn't remove, that they were landowners and now citizens and subject to the laws of the state, and that in fact, Standing Wolf's father was there among them. So Standing Wolf then goes and joins that settlement. Ultimately, these army expeditions come to that community. They come to that settlement in October, uh, Charles Larned, he's, he's trying to find these fugitives and other fugitives that are still in the mountains. So he goes uh, to the settlement on the Okona Lefty River. He's writing back that that's occupied by people who've obtained citizenship under state law. Um, but he was informed that many of the runaways had taken refuge there. Um, he, he directs William Holland Thomas to come out to muster everybody and then count them against the list that Thomas had given him. That is 333 people. If he had any more than that or people that didn't match that list, he was going to arrest them. And this would include Standing Wolf and his family. They pull out this list. They start counting everybody out. When they do that, They find Standing Wolf is on the list already. He had taken out an insurance policy in 1837 with his father. So the army doesn't see him and his family as a problem and they move along. But they move along to pursue other fugitives in the mountains. And this is the period during which the people who had hidden out um, had the greatest travails they were not able to, uh, to access any of their food stores. They were having to forage um, and they lived out in hiding for months. As you see from this testimony from Dick Agishka, who was a, a leader at Chiowa Town, he says when the troops commenced collecting, he and his family kept out of the way, that they were deprived of any means of subsistence and compelled to, to subsist on the sap of trees and roots and nearly all of the children belonging to his people died. Only about two children remained out of a population of nearly 100. And we see this story over and over again. A census taken in 1840 uh, indicates the individuals who died during removal. And most of them in North Carolina died um, during August, September, uh, and October of 1838. What happens during this, this, this sort of mass sweep where the army is constantly in there looking around for uh, Cherokee citizens who are hiding out in the mountains. Ultimately, um, in November, they run into an individual named Charlie or Jolly uh, and his family. And uh, finally, they are the only Cherokees who put up any kind of resistance to the army. They've been captured. Um, Zali and his sons then uh, kill two soldiers. They escape. And then a huge manhunt is on because at this point, um, the military pursuit of Cherokee fugitives is never going to end uh, because of this bloodshed. Ultimately, William Holland Thomas negotiates uh, with some of the people who are in hiding, particularly uh, Ujula or Uchella, who was one of the reservees of 1838, and his group of 100 to help them capture Charlie. Um, and so they go out to assist the army because what has now happened is those murders had gone outside of their original plan. It was um, probably the, the prime directive is do no harm, first do no harm. And so everybody who was hidden away knew they could not 
resort to any violent acts. And Charlie and his family had ultimately violated that. And so they were brought in by uh, Ujula and, and his group of people who were hiding out and executed um, according to, as William Holland Thomas later related, according to Klan law for a life and a life. What most of these accounts don't tell us is that uh, Ujula and, and Sally or Charlie were near neighbors and actually uh, close relatives. And so this was a, a, a very difficult undertaking for Ujula, but it knew that it was the only way that he could uh, preserve his people and be able to keep his people where they were um, in place in North Carolina. And so the executions of Sali and his sons and sons-in-law then ends the military pursuit of fugitives. Foster gives a blanket amnesty to uh, Ujula. We see the list of uh, uh, Ujula's group that had helped to capture Charlie. He issues a blanket amnesty, withdraws the troops and declares that military operations in North Carolina are now over and the attempts to deport people by force, capture them and deport them are also over. And of course, the, the movement of uh, Cherokee people toward the West from Fort Cass and the other immigration depots is already well underway at this point. So the Cherokees who are left behind in North Carolina are able to come out of hiding and then try to uh, rebuild their lives. which ultimately they do uh, very successfully. Uh, this is a, uh, William Holland Thomas remains as not only a legal agent, but also as a PR agent for the North Carolina Cherokees, uh, constantly trying to assure their, their participation uh, in uh, uh, larger claim settlements with the Cherokee Nation, but also constantly trying to assure their ability to remain in North Carolina. Uh, he issued constant press releases here in, in one from uh, 1843. What he says is that the, uh, there are 800 people there around Qualatown, and his uh, census in 1840 had counted over 1,000 Cherokee people remaining in the East. Not everyone was happy with this, certainly the governor of North Carolina. Uh, was petitioning to constantly to have Cherokee people uh, then removed to the West. Um, but there were enough allies in state government to prevent that, including George Hayes, who had now become a state uh, representative, and ultimately um, Will Thomas, who became a state senator. People like Andrew Barnard remarked that as the Cherokee folks were coming out of hiding. He says they're forming settlements, building townhouses, and show every disposition to keep up their former manners and customs of councils, dances, ball plays, and other practices. And Barnard figured that that would actually corrupt the white youth who were there. Um, but that didn't stop folks from reestablishing communities using the old plans of corporate towns. back up. And we see a number of enclaves that are then established, not only in the Qualatown area, they're, they're set out as particular communities that are named for Cherokee clans, like the Wolf Town, Paint Town, Bird Town, uh, Deer Town, and, and one of my favorites, Pretty Woman Town, um, there uh, north of the Tuckaseechee River. But there are also communities to the south Places like Sandtown, where Dikagishka's brother was head man, uh, at Buffalo Town and Chioa, where Dikagishka and, and ultimately Wachacha lived, out at Yellow Creek, down at Welch's Town, because John Welch had actually established a community there, out at Hanging Dog and Long Ridge. Folks were able to establish in these areas. Uh, largely because there were uh, individuals who were able to purchase large tracts of land, hold them in their own names, and then allow people to live there. Just 
in the same way that the reservees in 1817 and 1819 had intended, that they hold land, at least as far as the state of North Carolina or the federal government was concerned, they held land in severalty, but in fact, they were corporate entities that were holding their corporate communities together. So you see at the John and Betty Welch property down on Valley River, while John was being held in the brig at Fort Cass, and he was held there until November. In fact, he was held there until he went blind. He was turned out, pushed out the door, and had to find his way home more than 80 miles blind. Betty, who was a, a white and a citizen of the state of North Carolina, was able to go to the land sales that were being held in Franklin with cash because they were the uh, uh, wealthiest uh, stockholders in that part of the country and purchased 1,400 acres of land that they incorporated not only the former Welch farm, but then expanded to the north to include a couple of coves um, separated by Townhouse Ridge. And on that land, they then established uh, Welch's town. So more than 100 people who had been hiding out or who had escaped from Fort Cass came and took up residence on land that was held in Betty Welch's name, but for the benefit of all. And they were able to stay there for the next 10 years until they could acquire lands in their own names and regroup and reform and to reestablish their communities. In fact, build townhouses, hold councils, hold ball plays and continue their former customs as Andrew Barnard had, had um, objected to. Um, there was a, a, a wide array of people, big mix of people who lived on uh, uh, Welch's farm on Welch's land, uh, mostly people that the Welch's had known before the removal, but some, some other folks as well, people like John Axe there on the left. And then on the right, there's Stacy Welch. There's John Welch's daughter. So this was a, a community where uh, there were both traditional practices and new Western practices going on. And it was a new type of community being formed in the East at that time. So we'll bring you back to Kadua. What we see is that as John Welch had said, the people were, not, were determined not to abandon their country no matter what risk they might run. And why did they do this? Well, some people have suggested, well, you know, I, I guess the, the obvious thing is that people love their homes, but all Cherokee people love their homes. Why didn't this happen in other areas? It's been suggested to me that in fact, some of these people, the core of these people, maybe the people there on the Kadua Council, took it as their duty, and it was recognized as their duty to remain behind, to try to preserve the old places like Kadua, because if all of the places were left, if all of the places were abandoned, then the land itself would forget the Cherokee people. But as long as there were Cherokee people there, the land, the landscape, and everything that was in it knew that the Cherokee people belonged there that by staying in the East, by whatever risk they might run, they actually were placeholders. They maintained the right of return. They maintained this as a Cherokee place. And so sacred places like Kadua, it was important that they then remain and hold on to these places because if Kadua was thoroughly lost, completely alienated, and the Cherokee people themselves, as Onegi to Wagi, could no longer exist. I'm going to jump back one more time. This is the after story. What happens to, to Standing Wolf, one of our characters here? And George Hayes, as it turns out, is a, a, a patron of the Standing Wolf, a friend. In fact, he considers Standing Wolf as his surrogate father. And he gives testimony that Standing Wolf goes back to Kuala Town and that he remained there as of 1843 as a person of good character to be relied on for truth, honesty, and sobriety as anyone in his acquaintance. 
And in an 1853 article, he says that Standing Wolf uh, enjoys good health, is a good citizen, and his hope is firm and steadfast, and that he becomes a godly example for the white man. And he says, as for myself, if I did wrong, I hope I may yet repent, but I've never felt any remorse or conscience for it. In other words, he's been called out for having helped the Standing Wolf and he doesn't regret it for a moment. Standing Wolf and his family left a illustrious uh, group of descendants. That are the uh, descendants of Standing Wolf are found throughout the Eastern Band and some in the Cherokee Nation. And they included beloved man, Dr. Jerry Wolf, uh, who I had the privilege of knowing and who, who passed away recently, but he was a, a the face, the representative of uh, uh, Cherokee people to the many tens of thousands of visitors who went through the Museum of the Cherokee Indian. He was uh, in his 90s, a uh, sort of a docent and greeter there and would talk to, to uh, visitors about the Cherokee people. So just as Standing Wolf who appeared in national newspapers in the uh, 1850s and 1860s becomes the face of the Eastern Band, so does his descendant um, Jerry Wolf. And every time I read the stories of Standing Wolf, I hear everything in the voice of Jerry. So to come back to the theme of resilience, how is it that people pulled off what they did in North Carolina and how did they recover from all the stresses that that um, resistance to removal then levied upon them as a, uh, as a community of people and as their families and as individuals. And we see certain attributes that, that they put forward that allowed these folks not only to succeed in their endeavors to stay in their old country, but then allowed them to recover. And the first is they had a very clear dedication to community. That's evident even from the time of the treaties of 1817 and 1819, when they try to hold their communities together by securing land bases for them. They took community action. They planned together as a people. They established networks and alliances. They reached out, they pulled in non-Cherokee people like William Holland Thomas, George Hayes, Emmanuel Schuler, and others who they had um, uh, instructed in Cherokee, who they considered their friends, but who were able to reach outside. They engaged in long-term planning. And they engaged in contingency planning. So when one part of the plan went wrong, they had a backup. Ultimately, they exhibited extreme flexibility, ability to adapt to those contingencies, and they persisted. So with that, I'll say Wado, and as folks say in the Eastern Band, ski, ski. <laughs> <laughs>